Well, good morning, church. Isn't it great having all these kids and families? Last service we had some also. It's so good. We want to be a church that continues to invest in future generations. I'll talk more about that in just a minute. So if you're visiting Kingsway, we're really glad you're here. Welcome. If you're watching at home online, welcome. We're glad you're here. We've been working through the book of Luke since last December. We paused a couple times at this or that or the other thing, and we just finished a long series on marriage, and now we're coming back to the book of Luke, picking up where we left off in Luke chapter 8. And here's the problem I have in Luke chapter 8. I don't know anything about farming, and I know very little little about gardening. Uh, there are two things in life I don't do really well. There's, there's lots of things I don't do well, but there's two I do really poorly. That is cook and garden. Those are the two things I do really, really poorly. So when we get to a text like today, I find myself a little bit confused. Maybe you do too. So let's go ahead and pick up where Jesus picks up. In Luke chapter 8, he says this, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, now let's just stop real quick. Today, when we do farming, we have these big machines, they they, they till the land, they like dig these holes or ruts, and then they drop the seed right where you want it to be, perfectly spaced apart, and that's just not how farming was done back in the day. So farming was done back in the day. Sometimes you'd have animals till the ground or whatever, but then the farmer would scatter seed, and some would fall where it was supposed to, and some fell in other places. And that goes to his analogy. So what Jesus says next to verse, well, if we go back to verse five, he says, some fell along the path, it was trampled on, and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop. A hundred times more than was sown. Now, you get to the end of these few verses and you go, good to know, Jesus. Super glad you told me that. Seems really helpful. Now, what you need to picture is, I got to see this about 18 months ago when I went to Israel for the first time. The Sea of Galilee, it's over in the Middle East, big sea. Jesus spent roughly 80% of his ministry around the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is the lowest freshwater lake in the world. It is the second lowest overall lake in the world. It sits pretty low. It has one major feeding system, the Jordan River. It's got some other springs that bubble up into it. And there's one huge mountain, Mount Hermon, nearby. Now that all goes to the story because since Jesus did most of his ministry around the sea, when he wanted to teach, one of the things that Jesus did is he would get into a boat. He would push out into the water. And because it sat so low, the hillside sits up. It was like perfect acoustic. You could hear without this microphone whatsoever. It's a really cool, it's almost like the guy who made it knew what was going on. But anyway, as he continued to teach this, now you need to picture, we find out from Mark chapter four that Jesus is in a boat. He's talking to these people sitting on a hillside. And as he's doing that, he just starts throwing out this farming analogy. The disciples are not too far away and they're quite confused. And so they pull Jesus aside after the crowds have kind of dispersed. They're like, Jesus, Jesus, great job. Like really well done. What does it mean? (laughs) Now, I don't know if you've ever felt like that with Jesus. Uh, I have these two nieces, they're twins and uh, they're 16 years old now, and they, they tell me all the time, we love having a pastor on text. So they, they literally would just get all these questions about God or the faith or the world, and they'll just text me. I don't know where all the time, like, hey, what about this? And what about this? And what about this? And what about this? And, I, and it feels a little bit like these little disciples, right? Like, hey, uh, how do you answer this one, Jesus? So Jesus goes on, and I don't have this verse on the screen. Jesus goes and basically tells them, I speak in parables to confuse people. And if you've ever experienced Jesus, you know sometimes he speaks of parables that are quite confusing. The prophet Isaiah told us when Messiah come, he was going to do this. But doesn't it bring up a great question? Like, why are you so confusing, Jesus? Why do you make this so hard? Apparently, Jesus had never watched a TED Talk and figured out how to publicly speak. No, 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 no. That's not what's happening here. Jesus is a master orator and a master storyteller. And when we get to like chapter 15 of Luke, you are going to see it. It is unbelievable, the the intricacies of what Jesus does in that chapter. But here we are in chapter 8, and the disciples are like, Jesus, like, great. You just told us about a farmer and some seed. You had all these people gathered on this hill. You had the boat and the lake. You had the perfect chance to hit a home run. What are you doing? Like, why are you doing this? And here's what we find. And you need to get this because this makes sense of everything else in the book of Luke. Jesus is content with you not wanting him. Let that sink in for a second. 
It's not what he wants. It's not what he desires. It's just that he's a gentleman. He's never going to force you to trust him. He's going to open the door for you to trust him. He's going to die on a cross and build a bridge for you to come to know him. But at the end of the day, you will have a choice. And what you do with that choice will dictate everything. So Jesus is okay with speaking in parables because Jesus is doing two major things. One, he is continuing to confound your enemy. Your enemy, who you've never really actually met, but he's your spiritual enemy. We, we call him Satan or the devil, right? It's the perfect time of the year to talk about him. He gets a lot of pub over the next, you know, 48, 72 hours. Your enemy, who the scriptures say wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to ruin your life. But he has been studying this book for a really, really long time. He's an expert in this book. He knows it better than you do, I promise. But he didn't understand everything either. So part of what Jesus is doing when he's speaking in parables is he's confounding the enemy who can only stand, understand so much. But the other thing he's doing is he's making it just hard enough that anybody who wants to find him will find him. And anybody who wants to learn will learn. And anybody who wants to receive will receive. But anybody who doesn't, they'll give up and walk away. And that's a choice that they're making. I have found, I'm just being honest, I have found, I still have questions about God's word. Especially right now, there's a big war going on in the Middle East. I don't know if you've heard of it. There's another one going on in Ukraine, if you've heard of that either. And so what you get if you turn on YouTube or the news or whatever your favorite website is, you get, you get these Christians who claim to be experts telling you that we are sitting at the second coming's door. In fact, it's happening any day now, any week now, any month now. Just wait. These two things, three things happen. Woo, here we are. Then you go listen to other guys with other degrees, and they go, that's absolutely wrong. Nothing happening in the Middle East or Ukraine right now has anything to do with the second coming. And I'm telling you, I know godly men and women on both sides of that coin, and I love to study this stuff. And I guarantee you, I put in more hours than most of you, and I still look at it and go, huh, Jesus, what are you talking about? <laughs> because sometimes the things Jesus says are hard. That hardness can either make me quit on him, or that hardness can make me push through and say, even when I don't understand, I trust you. That's why in Luke 8, 8, Jesus goes on and he says, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. And this is what's fascinating. When he said this, all that other stuff he just said, he just randomly calls out, right? Farmer scatters seed, falls here, falls here, falls here. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. That is awkward. <laughs> it was just as awkward as what I just did. <laughs> and everybody's like, I've got two of them. I have no idea what you're saying. And that's when the disciples pull him aside. They're like, what are you saying? And then Jesus describes what he's saying. And here's what he says to them. Verse 11, this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Let's just stop for a second. So this book that I keep holding up, we call it the Bible. Now, someday maybe I'll do an entire sermon on what that means. But when I was a teenager, I was raised in a Christian home. I believed in Jesus because my parents believed in Jesus. I gave my life to Christ in December when I was 12 years old. I was baptized into Christ. And somewhere between 13 and 16, I started to question whether any of this was trustworthy or true. Really what I was doing is I was going through some really painful and hard seasons in my life. It was months after I gave my life to Christ that I broke my pelvic bone. Many of you have heard that story. My dad's job went through a major transition and we switched from a school where I was really well connected, had a lot of friends, and now I was a new kid at a new school with a broken pelvic bone. And I felt like an outcast, I felt like an outsider, I had no friends, life was miserable. And it made me wonder if God was real and if, could I trust him and could I know him and all the things. And I say that because one of the anchors that, that God gave me in that season that I could trust him was confidence in this book that it is, as Jesus says, the word of God. This book, I found out later, there are roughly 66 books within this book. The book, the book of Genesis, the book of Exodus, the book of Leviticus. We could, I won't go through all 66. There are two major what we call testaments. The Old Testament, 
points to Jesus. The New Testament testifies to Jesus. The reason we call it the Old Testament, the New Testament, both of them testify to the life of Jesus. And that's the craziness of the power of this book. It's written over thousands of years, at least 1,500, three different languages, three different continents, and at least 30 different authors. A guy like Paul wrote many different books. We don't know exactly how many authors there are, but we know there's well over 30. Crazy. How do you explain that if it's not from God himself? It's been said that there are hundreds and hundreds of prophecies, depending on what you count, over 300 prophecies that came true in Jesus' first coming, prophecies. Things as specific as he'll be born of a virgin. Well, you can question whether or not she was a virgin, but the people in the first century didn't question whether she was born of a virgin. Things like he'll be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, written about hundreds of years before he came. One apologetics, uh, apologetics is when you make an apology, not and I'm sorry, but an argument for the faith. One gentleman who made an argument for the faith took a small amount of these prophecies, less than two handfuls worth, and said, uh, what would be the odds of those coming true? And then he calculated those odds, and then he came up with an analogy to help you understand just how impossible it would be for that to come true about him. And here's the conclusion he came to. If you were to take an area roughly the size of the state of Texas, if you were to fill it uh, about up to the knee high with silver dollars, the entire state of Texas, then take a person and blindfold them, stick them anywhere in the state of Texas and tell them to wander around. Then take a helicopter, fly over the state of Texas, take one of those silver dollars, spray paint it gold and drop it randomly in the state of Texas. Tell the blindfolded person, take as long as you need, but when you're ready, grab one silver dollar and pick it up and let's see if you got that one spray painted silver dollar. That's statistically the odds of just two handfuls of these prophecies coming true in Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus has confidence because what we believe is even though these were written by human authors, it was through what we call the inspiration of the Holy Spirit pushing through them to write these things down. And so Jesus says, here's the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. So the seed has never changed. The seed is unchanging. It's faithful. It's trustworthy. It's true from generation to generation. It's not going anywhere. But some of that seed, it falls in different places, like the farmer scattering. So those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Remember, the analogy there was that there's feet that trampled on the path and then a bird came and ate up the trampled seed. So that whole picture of what Jesus was saying, his whole point in saying that was because in many of your lives, in many of your neighbors' lives, your family's lives, even your kids' lives, you have an enemy who wants to trample on you and then steal what was planted into your heart. But all of this is coming from verse 8, 8, where Jesus said, remember, let him who has ears to hear, hear. In other words, there's a warning for you. There's a a, a listening that you have to do that is yours to do. There's a work that is yours to do. This is good enough to accomplish everything it's set out to accomplish, but there's still something I must do to keep it, to retain it, to hold on to it, to protect it, to apply it. And we have an enemy who wants to take it. Verse 13, those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. The time of testing? I lived in Colorado. Colorado is a high desert. We lived there 10 years. What I found out is there's not a lot of water in Colorado. (laughs) And so when people are doing gardening in Colorado, you don't see green everywhere. You see green where people can afford to water it or where there's enough water rights to water it. But most of the time in Colorado, about 10 to 11 months out of the year, everything is yellow and brown. You remember, you ever see tumbleweeds like in an old West, Western kind of thing? Like, holy cow, we drove to Colorado and found out that's a real thing. There are these massive weeds that spring up. They get like really big, but they're so shallow because everything is not watered very deeply. They don't go anywhere. It's rocky. And so they just kind of dry up. And then you get this really strong wind and it just pulls it up out of the ground and blows away. That's the analogy Jesus is going for. 
Except in this picture, what he's saying is the word of God jumps in and it starts to take root. But times of testing, something painful or difficult you didn't expect comes. And what you find is your roots didn't go down deep enough to make a real difference. So when the hardship comes, just it uproots you and you blow away from the Lord. Verse 14, the seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear. But as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. Choked by. You picture these thorns or thistles that are just surrounding a beautiful flower, and the flower's fighting to get through, but it's just taking so much extra time and effort and energy that eventually it just dies. And I find this fascinating. Notice he said, life's worries, that's bad. Life's riches, oh, that's good. Life's pleasures, well, that could go either way. Right? This is why when I'm talking to parents who have a prodigal child, a wayward child, I often tell them, I want you to pray the most dangerous prayer you can imagine praying. I want you to pray that God would give either blessings or pain into their life, which everyone God knows is gonna lead them back to him. Oh, and that's a dangerous prayer. There are a few people in this world that when they receive life's goodness, they go, I don't feel like I'm worthy of all of this. There has to be someone who has blessed me beyond what I deserve. But for most of us, it's not the good things that lead us back to the Lord. What is it? It's pain. Because see, in moments of life's storms, you have a choice to make. Will I go with him or will I go against him? Which is why Luke 8, 15, he says, but the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. There's a lot more to unpack. I'll come, I'm gonna come back to this word retain and this word persevering. I just wanna focus for a minute on this word produce for a minute. Because here's the thing, God intends for his word planted in you to bring about change in everybody else around you. So, when you receive the word of God and it starts to change you, you become a better husband, you become a better wife, you become a better father, you become a better mother. You become a better school teacher, you become a better businessman, you become a better accountant, you become a better salesman. You become better at everything you do because God's word is changing you and the impact goes on into other people. So as your kindness is growing, that kindness impacts everybody around you. As your faithfulness is growing, that faithfulness impacts others around you. As your patience is growing, that patience impacts others around you. And I could keep going through these things that Paul calls the fruits of the Spirit. God's work in us is impacting other people. It was intended to produce a crop, not just for us. There's this great danger in America. And guys like me, pastors like me, have been saying this for about 50 years now. We got a major problem. We have something called cultural Christianity or consumer Christianity. And the whole idea is I'll come to church when it benefits me or my family. As long as the message is on what I'm dealing with this week, I'll keep showing up. As long as I'm getting something out of it. So we start to view membership the way we do the golf club or some other group, Costco or something that we're a part of, right? I paid my dues, they owe me. Give me something. Instead of asking the question, what is God trying to do in me for the benefit of the world? And we wanna be known as a church who doesn't ask the question, what's in it for me, but asks instead the question, God, what do you wanna do in the world through me, because when a tree produces apples, those apples feed lots of people. And when you take some of those apples and you plant them into the ground, those same seeds, guess what they do? They produce more trees, they guess what they do? They produce more apples, which feed more people, which plant more into the ground. That's the picture of what God wants from your life. So, yeah, yeah, you can stop, give God the glory. So what we've been asking as a church is, God, how do you want to see us plant more fruit into the ground? How do you want to see us put more apples, more seeds into the ground to do more? We launched something last January called Relentless Pursuit. You can always find more, relentlesspursuit.org-org, I think, relentless-pursuit.org, and uh, you can get more information there. But we told you in January of this past year that we wanted to launch something called um, a learning academy. And the reason that we wanted to do this is because we researched our community. We met with a bunch of community leaders, said, what does our community need? How can we figure out how to partner with 
our community. And what we found was our locally, they go by different names, learning academies or daycares, depending on which ones, but they're at 98% capacity. And so what we found is there are even families in our church who would literally drop their kid, one kid off at one place, drive 15, 20 minutes, drop their kid off at another place. Then they got to go to work. Then they got to figure out all the work schedule. Then they got to go back and pick up another kid. They go pick up the other kid. And people are doing this all over Hendricks County and beyond. And so we just started a conversation and we're happy to say that we are now under contract with a with somebody we're looking to part with and their name is Pathways Learning Academy. Pathways Learning Academy. I'm really excited. Let's stop and give God the glory that we are under a contract with them. Yeah. They focus on esteem, it stands for science, technology, engineering, arts and math. Thank you. All the people out there are like, here you go, Pastor, read your notes. No. So uh, we're really excited to partner with them. Their job is to prepare young kids for what is coming next when they move on into preschool. So I say that because even though we're going to partner together with them, uh, we're most excited about the impact that we get to have into families that perhaps we aren't even currently reaching. There's a large church around Indianapolis that has already has a partnership with Pathways, and uh, I sat down with their pastor, and uh, I just said, hey, how are you guys reaching the lost in your community? And he said, this is one of the biggest ways. We're seeing families come there first, wherever they are in their faith, but we get a chance to build a bridge to them, and then they later come to faith in Jesus, and they're coming to our church. So we're excited about the opportunity. But because of that, what we want to do is next Sunday, we want to gather together, and uh, we're going to just eat, and then we're going to walk through this space. So you can get a visual in your head, like where are we talking about? Where would they be located? And then what we want to do is pray over these spaces. Because we believe that God really is listening. He really is paying attention. He's tuned in right now. We want to pray that God would do a great move and a great work in this space before we get in there. So we're going to invite you, bring your kids, uh, bring your whatever, bring your family, bring your friends, bring your neighbors, and we'll, walk, we'll eat and then we'll walk through the space. We'll pray through the space together. This is November the 5th, which I think is next Sunday. Yes, next Sunday at 1230. You can learn more uh, online. All right. Let me get done with my announcement on RP and get back to my sermon, because I want to come back to this idea of holding on to God's word and retaining it. Remember, Jesus said anybody who takes God's word and retains it, or the word could be restrains it, depending on the context of the sentence. So the word to retain or to restrain the word of God means to hold fast or to keep secure. It can actually mean it in the opposite sense. It can mean to restrain something, like to not let it escape from you. It just give you an analogy. If I were to take this book and the truths within this book and I were to hold on to them, you imagine that's an aggressive kind of thing. Imagine we're playing like capture the flag. And the thing is, I have an enemy who wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to take the truths of this word and rip it away from me. And I am retaining it. I'm, I'm keeping him from doing it. This word that's used here in the Greek for restrain, it's sometimes used in other Greek writings to describe a boat that's been anchored to a dock. And so you tie it to the dock so that even though the waves are trying to pull it out and to pull it away from you, at the same time, it is being restrained, held back, so that you never lose we live in a world today that says deconstruct your faith, tear everything down to its smallest part so that when you have all these questions left on the table and you can't find answers for everything, you'll realize it wasn't worth it. And Jesus is saying, I want you to do the opposite. Ask all the questions you want. The disciples did. Jesus, I don't understand. But hold on to, retain, restrain the word of God that was planted in James, the half-brother of Jesus, I say half because his daddy was Joseph, whereas Jesus' daddy is God the Father. He says, do not merely listen to the word, and in doing so, deceive yourself. Instead, do what it says. What you will find, if you are a Christian for any length of time, is there are a lot of things in this book that are really encouraging. Like, when you need it, God's word is there, like... I am for you and not against you. Uh, and, and when you're with me, nothing can come against you because I am for you or I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, there's so many great verses. When the deep waters come, I will be with you. I mean, oh, there's so many good things. I promise I'll work all things together for the good of those who love me. I mean, th this book is so full of encouragement. It's also full of really offensive passages where it keeps telling my wife just how broken and messed up she is. I mean, I feel bad for her. <laughs> I love you and I'm kidding. Yeah, I am in trouble now. It wouldn't be the first time. It won't be the last time. No, I'm serious. This book, man, it... Tell me I'm selfish all the time. 
It tells me how prideful I can be and arrogant I can be and unloving and unkind. And... But wouldn't you expect a good God to tell you both the truth and in love? I mean, what kind of a friend never tells us we got food in our teeth? Right? How much more so a friend who never tells us, do you realize how rude you are at times? And God's a great friend. He's an even better father. So don't merely listen to this word. Do something with it. Apply it. Change something as a result of what you hear. Now, the second thing I told you I want to emphasize by persevering, produce a good crop. The word for persevering here is hupomone, not that you care, but it literally is two words smashed together. Those two words smashed together mean a remaining under or a patient endurance or endure under. They're two different words, like a compound word smashed together. What you can imagine is there's a weight, right, pushing down. And the word persevere means even though this weight is pushing down, right? Picture yourself working out. The easiest thing to do would be to toss the weight aside. Instead, they stay under the weight and they don't quit. Persevere. Even when the storm is hitting. That same guy, James, who I just quoted about not just listening but doing, he says this, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. The word blessed is used in scripture. I like to call it makarios because it sounds like macarena and I start to dance. <laughs> but it's actually pronounced makarios. And many will tell you it can actually be translated happy in our language. Happy are the one who perseveres under trial. Said no one ever. <laughs> Except Jesus. In this case, he said it through James. Happy is the one who perseveres. Why? Because at the end of it all, when you've persevered through that test, you're going to receive something that God has promised those who love him. That means the very worst thing that can happen to you is death. That's it. And then the other side of death, eternal life found in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So the worst this world could do to you is kill you. And that may sound terrible. Don't get me wrong. I'm not excited about whatever I have to go through right before I die. But oh man, I'm ready. I'm ready for Jesus to come back. I, whatever it takes, I'm ready. Like, I want to go stand before Jesus. I want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful. I want to take, I want to see him take his thumbs and wipe the tears from my eyes like a little child. I want to see him right all the evils and the wrongs of the things that I've read about that are happening in the Middle East and are happening in Ukraine. I want to see, yes, I want to see. I want to see Jesus right all the evils of racism and poverty and, and greed and suffering and selfishness. And I want to see him do it. I'm ready for him to do it. But if he should wait another few hundred years and my life has to end before he comes back, then let it be said of me that I persevered until the end. Now for you, what was the last thing the Lord told you to do? And have you done it? You're like, I, I don't know, Pastor, what, what do you mean was the last thing? I'm like, well, I mean, sometimes it's in a sermon. Sometimes it's in your devotion time. Sometimes it's on the radio in a car. Sometimes it's a wise spiritual friend who comes to you and says, hey, you need to knock that out. When was the last time God spoke to you? You knew, like, I need to do this. I'm convicted, and did you do it? And if not, instead of asking God for something new, what if we just go back and be obedient? What if we just be a people who say, yes, yes, Lord, whatever you want? because you know better than me, and I want the word to fall in a good place in my life. Now, before I wrap up today, and I just have a few minutes to do this, I wanna take you through one more story that's gonna set up the rest of this series, and it really will be quick, but I think it's gonna hit hard for some of you. Luke 8, 22, the next thing that happens, it says, one day, Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out. The reason I, I want to tell you that is because what we find is there are, there are four what we call gospel books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're in Luke, the third one. 
We know these first three books leaned into each other when they were writing it. We don't know who wrote first. John, he's just doing his own thing. It's another conversation for another day. But what we see is if you go back to Mark, the second book, and you compare these two stories, in the book of Mark, we learn that this story about the boat actually came right on the same day as all this other stuff Jesus is teaching. In fact, in Mark chapter 4, verse 36, it says, leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. And that may seem like an insignificant detail, but because of what's about to happen next in the book of Luke, I think it's a crazy important detail. Again, what you see is the Sea of Galilee sits really low, second, or the, the lowest freshwater lake, second lowest lake in the world. Mount Hermon is not far away, the only mountain in the area, snow-capped, really tall, beautiful. Because of this setup, what can happen is the wind can come rushing over Mount Hermon and create like a, a toilet bowl scenario down on top of the Sea of Galilee. Not just can a storm, a squall come up over the sea, but it can swirl very intensely with very little prediction or knowledge that it's happening at all. Some of the disciples we know are fishermen. So now picture this, Jesus is in a boat, he's teaching the people on the side of the hill, it's the end of a day, the disciples are like, Jesus, what in the world is going on? The people are leaving just as confused as the disciples are, probably like some of you have at times, and then Jesus is already in the boat, just as he was in the boat. And then he says to them, hey guys, get in the boat, we're gonna go to the other side of the lake. See, Jesus is inviting the disciples into a bigger story than they had ever imagined was possible. We're gonna talk about that story next week, what he runs into on the other side of the lake. But let me just give you a foretaste. He runs into a man filled with demonic spirits. It'll be perfect following Halloween. It'll be great. <laughs> We're gonna unpack it. I'm not gonna run away from it. We're gonna deal with it. But see, if you knew that you were going to go in a boat and travel to the other side of the lake and face something crazy terrifying, you better know something in the middle. And that's the lesson that the disciples are about to learn. Verse 23, as they sailed, he fell asleep. He's been teaching. He's tired. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped as they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. Now, you got to understand the pieces of the story that make no sense. Again, some of these men are fishermen. This is the sea that they fished on. This is their workplace. They're experts here. But they believe, this storm was so intense, they believe they're going to die. We are not talking about men who are prone to exaggeration. We are talking about a group of men who, while Jesus is resting, they probably started bailing water as quickly as they could and tried not to bug him. And they're failing. And the boat is sinking. And the waves are crashing. And the wind and the rain are pouring. And they're legitimately afraid. Maybe they woke Jesus up because they needed another hand on deck to bail water. My guess is they didn't fully wake him up knowing he could solve that problem. I know because it says he got up, he rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided and all was calm. He didn't grab a bucket. The implication here, by the way, is not that over the next 30 minutes, everything calmed down. The implication here is instantly the storm was gone, instantly the waves were calm. And that ought to make you question some things. It ought to raise up some stuff in you. I would get it too if you're like, how do I know if this is true? I only know that every man on the boat that day began to be changed by what they saw. Verse 25, where is your faith, he asks the disciples. Is this really how you thought the story was going to end? You thought 
that I was going to get in a boat and take you guys to the other side of the lake and I was going to let a storm pop up and kill us. That, that's, in your mind, that's how this was playing out. Where is your faith? And in fear and amazement, they asked one another, who is this? He commands the winds and the water and they obey him. I was reading this this week. Guys, this is one of my favorite stories in the whole Bible. And I'm not joking. Easily top five. Because there was a season in my life when God brought this text to me and I thought I was gonna drown. Not literally, just from life. And I got offended by the same question the disciples were asked. Where's your faith, Matt? Really what it comes down to is, is your faith in what you can control? Is your faith in what you can handle? Is your faith in what you can manage? But it dawned on me this week when I was reading it. There is a crisis of faith that occurs when you realize that the storm you're with is way bigger than the storm you're in. I want you to let that one sink in for a minute. They're in the boat with the one that they would later figure out created the storms. He created the water. He created Mount Hermon. He created the hillside. He created the sun and the moon and the stars. He did it, and they're in the boat with him. And if they can't manage the storm, if they can't manage the waves, if they can't manage the wind, if they can't manage all of that, how in the world can they control him? And that ought to terrify you, just how big and awesome he is. I love the way Tim Keller, Keller says this, who just passed away of cancer this year. He said, if you live a long time, eventually your body will give out and you'll die. And maybe it'll happen sooner through an earthquake, a fire, or some other disaster. Nature is violent and overwhelming. It's unmanageable power, and it's gonna get you sooner or later. You may say, well, that's true. But if I go to Jesus, he's not under my control either. He lets things happen that I don't understand. He doesn't do things according to my plan or in a way that makes sense to me. But if Jesus is God, then he's got to be great enough to have some reasons to let you go through things you can't understand. His power is unbounded, but so are his wisdom and his love. And here's the thing, if I could just build a bridge to you this week and ask you to come back next week so we can keep the conversation going. It's not everything you need to know, it's just something. Here it is. Have you ever noticed that, like I was gone for the last couple of weeks, I was out of town, and when I came back, my grass was long and there were leaves falling, and so I had to cut the grass, probably my last cut of the year. But I was really annoyed because before I could cut it, I had to go all around my yard and pick up these dead sticks everywhere. Because see, while I was gone, there was enough wind and enough rain that these storms that had come through Avon, Indiana, had pruned my trees. And that's what storms do in our lives sometimes. Sometimes the purpose of the storm is to prune your life for more effectiveness. That's why persevering is such a big deal, right? Because if those branches stay on there, over time, they'll kill the tree the poison or the death, your trees, your bushes, your, they'll spend all of their time and energy chasing down these things. And it's okay for God to prune your life. And yes, pruning is hard. You're cutting away something. But sometimes storms do that in our lives. These disciples will never wonder again whether anything that they're facing is bigger than him. I guess that's not fair. They actually do wonder it again when he goes to the cross but they always had this truth as an anchor. I saw him calm the wind and the waves. If he can do that, what can he do in what I'm facing today? I just want to do, I want to pray because I know this falls on a lot of different places from the conversations I had after last service. And um, 
after I pray, we just wanna sing and worship God for his power and his might, right? So I'll stand, I'll pray, and then we'll worship him. Heavenly Father, thank you for being bigger than the storms of our lives. God, I pray over this room right now. We got our teenagers in here, the service. I pray over them, God. They live in a world that wants to continue to convince them that you aren't real, that they can't trust you, that there are holes in your word. God, I pray that everything that was said today and has been said throughout their lives would be planted in them like a seed that fell in good soil and may they take it and apply it. I pray for these little ones who are up here and all of the little ones represented in this room, God, who are being trained and mentored at Kingsway Christian Church. God, may their faith go deep. May their roots go deep into Jesus. God, may an entire generation be rebirthed in you. May it start here on the corner of 10th and Dan Jones. And God, for us today, whatever we're carrying, whatever pain or fear or anxiety or death lies before us, God, help us to fear you more than the storm and to know that we will see the goodness of the Lord and the land of the living, just like the psalmist said. And God, we love you and we praise you for your faithfulness to us in Jesus' name. All God's people said.